Welcome to Tuesdays with Merton. My name is Teresa Sandock. I'm a Servite sister and a member of the Tuesdays with Merton Planning Committee, along with Daniel Horan and Alan Colt. Dan is a Franciscan friar and director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. Alan is faculty in residence at Baldwin Wallace University and former holder of the university's chair in faith and life. He also serves on the board of directors of the International Thomas Merton Society. Tuesdays with Merton is co-sponsored by the International Thomas Merton Society and the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College. The webinars are aired on the second Tuesday of each month. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Robinson. Jim is a member of the Religious Studies Department at Iona University, where he serves as director of the Thomas Merton Contemplative Initiative and associate director of the Dignan Institute for Earth and Spirit. He received his PhD in theology from Fordham University, his MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and his BA from Drew University. He is a recent ITMS Shannon Fellow and a Green Faith Fellow. He is actively involved in a number of lay Catholic communities committed to embodying spirituality, ecology, and social justice, including Agape Community in Hardwick, Massachusetts, and Benin Casa Community in Guilford, Connecticut. Here now is Dr. James Robinson speaking on spirituality, sustainability, and social justice, embodying integral ecology with Thomas Merton and Rosemary Radford Ruther. Well, thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you, Dan and Alan and everyone involved in Tuesdays with Merton for the invitation. It is a blessing to be here. And thanks to everyone tuning in for your presence here tonight. I'd like to start with Iona University's land acknowledgement statement. And then I'd like to read a poem. The land on which we are gathered is part of the ancestral homeland and traditional territory of the Muncie speaking Lenape people. We pay respect to Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. This poem is called Remember, and it was written by Joy Harjo, indigenous poet and 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States. Remember, remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away to night. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen, to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people, and all people are you. 
Remember, you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Joy Harjo repeatedly calls us to remember our place in the wider web of life. She calls us to remember the elemental truth of our embeddedness in the earth community, a truth that continually confronts us at every level of our being and a truth that we are in the strange habit of constantly forgetting. As Pope Francis has it in Laudato Si, quote, we have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters, end quote. Our forgetfulness of this elemental truth has grave ramifications. Because of this forgetfulness, Francis suggests, the earth now cries out to us in a chorus of human and more than human voices. Throughout Laudato Si, Pope Francis articulates an integral ecology, which aims to account for the holistic link between environmentalism and social justice. Throughout the encyclical, this integral understanding of our eco-social crisis interweaves with a planetary and cosmic spirituality. Francis conveys a profound appreciation for material reality in both its cosmic scope and in its detailed particularity as the place in which divinity meets us. He vividly expresses this eco-spiritual consciousness in a passage such as the following, which is replete with Franciscan and Ignatian resonance. He writes, and I quote, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely. Hence, there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dewdrop, in a poor person's face. The ideal is not only to pass from the exterior to the interior to discover the action of God in the soul, but also to discover God in all things, end quote. Furthermore, this massive and expanding universe, which is drenched in God's presence, actively communicates God's tender love for each of us. For Francis, quote, the entire material universe speaks of God's love, God's boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is as it were, a caress of God, end quote. And yet, even as the myriad creatures of this earth can communicate God's loving presence to us, we so often fail to receive and reciprocate this message. In fact, we so often desecrate the very beings who would otherwise bear this sacred message to us. Picture, for instance, five hens packed into a single cage in a factory farm. Picture them among 25,000 other hens in similar cages stacked on top of each other. Picture one particular hen carving out her whole existence in the space equivalent to a sheet of paper. This is the industry standard, and the majority of eggs consumed in this country come from hens living in such conditions. What message do such hens communicate to us? What message do we communicate to them? For Francis, the earth not only 
extends caresses from God, the earth also cries out. And such cries, if we can attend to them, confront us with a troubling recognition and a call to total conversion. As Francis has it, quote, the violence present in our hearts is reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life, end quote. What might it mean for us to really stand before this distorted reflection, to contemplate our current condition, and to yearn for a better future? Throughout Laudato C, Francis helpfully insists on the enmeshment of ecological degradation and social injustice. Ours is a crisis that impacts hens and humans, bodies of water and bodies of flesh. And this crisis is ultimately perpetuated by human-made systems of injustice. As Francis puts it, quote, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature, end quote. Francis employs the term integral ecology throughout Laudato Si in an effort to illuminate the complexity of our eco-social crisis, as well as the holistic response that this crisis requires. Furthermore, Francis emphasizes throughout the encyclical that his intention is to promote dialogue in order to constructively and creatively move forward. As he puts it, quote, in this encyclical, I would like to enter into dialogue with all people about our common home, end quote. In this spirit, I would like to bend time and space by placing Francis's understanding of integral ecology into conversation with the insights of two great dialogue partners, Thomas Merton and Rosemary Radford Ruther. First, a little about Merton and Ruther's own dialogue. In August of 1966, while she was a 29-year-old scholar living in Washington, D.C. and teaching at Howard University, Ruther wrote to Merton, initiating what would become a vibrant exchange of nearly 40 letters. The entire collection of these letters was compiled and edited by Mary Tardif and published by Orbis Books in 1995 under the title At Home in the World. These letters of Merton and Ruther stand at the center of my dissertation, which I completed at Fordham in 2020 through the mentorship of Janine Hill Fletcher. I recently wrote about these letters in an essay titled The Age of Rosemary's, Thomas Merton's Engagement with Rosemary Radford Ruther and Rosemary Houghton, which was published in volume 34 of the Merton Annual. I also wrote about these letters in an article on Ruther for the March through April edition of The Catholic Worker. In this talk, I will extend beyond the boundaries of Merton and Ruther's actual exchange of letters by placing some insights from their broader bodies of work into conversation. And I will weave these insights together with Francis's call for an integral ecology. So let's turn first to Merton, and let's specifically turn to Merton's engagement with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. 
Over the course of three weeks, in June of 1962, the New Yorker published Silent Spring in three sections. The full text was eventually published in book form in September of 62. Merton read this text and wrote to Carson just months after its publication. Imagine Merton, a monk who steeped himself in contemplative silence and who celebrated bird song in the woods of Gethsemane, reading a passage like the following one. In this haunting passage and throughout her book, Rachel Carson invites her readers to consider the terrifying possibility of a spring like this. She writes, and I quote, there was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people baffled and disturbed spoke of them. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds to be seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. In the mornings, which had once throbbed with the dawn chorus of robins, catbirds, doves, jays, and wrens, and scores of other bird voices, there was now no sound. Only silence lay over the fields and woods and marshes, end quote. Carson argues that such a bleak season could and would be brought about through the reckless application of chemicals commonly referred to as insecticides or pesticides. Carson suggests that such chemicals, which are applied with the intention of merely killing insects, are in fact inaccurately named. She queries, and I quote, can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides, end quote. Prior to reading Silent Spring, Merton had been personally involved in applying the particularly toxic biocide known as DDT, on the grounds of Gethsemane. After reading the book, he vowed to stop. In a journal entry penned on December 11th, 1962, just after receiving notice of the publication of Silent Spring, Merton responds to a predicted critic. This critic, he imagines, will call him out for extending ethical attention to birds in an era of such vast human suffering. Merton retorts with what we might acknowledge as an integral ecological understanding. For Merton, the suffering of birds cannot possibly be disentangled from the suffering of people. Both are symptomatic of a shared sickness. Merton writes, quote, some will say you worry about birds. Why not worry about people? I worry about both birds and people. We are in the world and part of it, and we are destroying everything because we are destroying ourselves, spiritually, morally, and in every way. It is all part of the same sickness and it all hangs together, end quote. As we contemplate the nature and implications of this sickness, we might recall Pope Francis's observation that, quote, the violence present in our hearts is reflected in the symptoms of sickness, evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life, end quote. On January 12th, 1963, while reading Silent Spring, Merton expands upon these initial reflections in a letter that he addresses to Rachel Carson. Monica Weiss identifies this day in Merton's life as a, quote, 
turning point in the ecological consciousness of Thomas Merton, end quote. She interprets Merton's reading of Silent Spring as an epiphany comparable to his awakening to the goodness of humanity at the corner of Fourth and Walnut. She suggests that Silent Spring, quote, appears to have allowed him to see how human justice is related to eco-justice, end quote. In other words, Silent Spring sparked in Merton an integral perspective. Indeed, Merton states that Silent Spring skillfully illuminates an, quote, essential piece of evidence for the diagnosis of the ills of our civilization, end quote. He muses that the book gestures toward a, quote, consistent pattern running through everything that we do, through every aspect of our culture, our thought, our economy, our whole way of life, end quote. For Merton, the symptoms that manifest tangibly in the broken bodies of creation must be traced to a deep and irrational sickness that leads human beings to turn against the community of life. In an explicitly theological move, still within this letter to Rachel Carson, Merton suggests that creation can and should be viewed as a, quote, transparent manifestation of the love of God, end quote, in which the wisdom of God manifests in all creatures, quote, down to the tiniest and in the most wonderful interrelationship between them, end quote. Like Pope Francis, Merton finds that creation tangibly manifests the love of God in its cosmic scope, in its detailed particularity, and in the interdependence which links insects with galaxies. For Merton, we have traded our sensitivity and wisdom for domination. And this has left us, quote, blundering around aimlessly in the midst of the wonderful works of God, end quote. Merton suggests that the sickness which distorts humanity's capacity for relating to the earth in a life-giving manner underlies both the local destruction brought about by the application of toxic pesticides and the vast devastation wrought by nuclear war. Merton expresses his hope to Carson that, quote, lawmakers will be able to see the connection between what you say and the vastly more important problem of nuclear war. The relationship is so terribly close. It is exactly the same kind of logic, end quote. As he has it, quote, the awful irresponsibility with which we scorn the smallest values is part of the same portentous irresponsibility with which we dare to use our titanic power in a way that threatens not only civilization, but life itself, end quote. Merton calls us to convert away from the death dealing sickness, which manifests in and through the reckless application of chemical pesticides, as well as nuclear weapons. This sickness, like all sickness, requires first recognition and next the constructive responses, which will bring about profound healing, salvation the saving of ourselves as well as the birds and people with whom we share our lives. As we seek integral saving from the sickness Merton illustrates, I'd like to briefly lift up a contemporary artistic initiative, which weaves together spiritual depth, ecological consciousness, and an activist intention to shift the status quo. This is the work of Angela Mano. And we were blessed to be joined by Angela at Iona this past semester as she displayed her work 
through an on-campus exhibition titled Saving Beauty, Contemporary Icons of Threatened and Endangered Species. In her work, Angela creatively applies the methods of traditional iconography in order to depict threatened and endangered species as both sacred beings conveying God's presence and as beings who have been deeply harmed by human activity. I'd like to specifically lift up Angela's icon of the honeybee. As Angela has it, and I quote, this industrious iconic insect gives humans so much in the way of their honey, pollen, and irreplaceable work as pollinators. They are severely threatened due to the use of toxic pesticides, destruction of habitat, and lack of forage due to monocultures, end quote. As we aim to do the integral work of genuinely caring for birds and people, ecosystems and societies, bees and bodies, this will require a creative grappling with the interior sickness that Merton points to, the sickness that twists our relationship with the natural world. Perhaps this creative grappling will be grounded in the spiritual work of remembering our place within the broader body of the earth. It will require, in other words, a shift from sickness to sensitivity and from violence to communion. As we quest for an integral ecology, we must grapple with this interior sickness while simultaneously resisting and transforming the systems of injustice which spring from this sickness and which reinforce it. Here we turn to the work of Rosemary Radford Ruther. Rosemary Radford Ruther has been addressing the link between ecological degradation and social injustice since the 70s. In other words, she began articulating an integral ecological perspective 40 years prior to the publication of Laudato Si. As Ruther has it as early as 1975 in New Woman, New Earth, quote, an ecological revolution must overthrow all the social structures of domination, end quote. Ruther builds on this core insight throughout her career. As she has it in Gaia and God, published in 1992, quote, if dominating and destructive relations to the earth are intertwined with gender, class, and racial domination, then a healed relation to the earth demands a social reordering. In short, it demands that we must speak of eco-justice and not simply domination of the earth as though that happened unrelated to social domination, end quote. Throughout her body of work, Ruther grapples with systems of domination, including patriarchy, white supremacy, corporate globalization, and militarism as they interact and intersect in oppressing human and more than human life. Ruther, like Francis, leads us to understand that if we are interested in integral ecology, we must actively recognize, resist, and transform these sick systems. In the remaining space of this presentation, I will specifically lift up Ruther's critique of the system of militarism. Ruther invites her readers to recognize that militarism and the death dealing weapons that it produces, maintains and deploys brings about both social and ecological ruin. 
She leads us to recognize that incarnating integral ecology is simply impossible in the context of militarism. For Ruther, through the mechanisms of militarism, quote, the earth is reduced to resources to be used and interdependence with nature or with other people is denied, end quote. In the context of contemporary warfare, the total destructive potential of war takes on a particularly vivid and haunting shape. As Ruther has it in an essay titled Feminism and Peace, quote, war making has reached such a level of destructiveness that the defeat of one side means the defeat of all the destruction of the earth itself, end quote. She insists that if we are to, quote, end the violence that threatens all humanity and the planet itself, end quote, we must seek the ultimate renunciation of war altogether, end quote. Ruther insists in no uncertain terms that, quote, militarism must be seen as the ultimate polluter of the earth, end quote. She observes that even the mere maintenance of military systems causes significant ecological destruction. Large portions of land are claimed for military training and the testing of weapons and armies are, quote, enormous users of petroleum and emit a large share of air pollutants, end quote. Furthermore, the testing of nuclear weapons, which occurs, quote, primarily in regions of native or colonized people, such as the Pacific Islands, contaminates entire regions, end quote. Ruther insists that, quote, genuine demilitarization across the board is the sine qua non of any genuine, ecologically sustainable, biospheric community. As a system of domination, Militarism structures our lives in ways both subtle and overt. Its toxic products impinge upon our existence constantly, including through the food we consume. Ruther observes that the origins of pesticides, or as Carson calls them, biocides, lie in warfare as many of the chemicals that constitute these products were developed and deployed during the First and Second World Wars in order to, quote, kill humans and destroy foliage, end quote. Such substances were designed by minds driven to craft implements of war, and they were adapted to specifically destroy, quote, pests, end quote, but the range of their destruction ripples out to include birds, fish, reptiles, and mammals, and they can injure and even kill human beings in extreme doses. Ruther argues that the rampant deployment of biocides in contemporary agriculture, quote, expresses a mentality of looking at nature as something to be conquered and subdued, rather than as a living world that humans work with and within. As we consider the possibility of embodying sustainable and just alternatives to the present sick system, we might turn to one final insight from Ruther, namely her advocacy for the construction of what she calls base communities of celebration and resistance. Such communities, Ruther muses, can serve as particularly powerful circles for enfleshing eco-social transformation. Such communities enable those involved in them to weave together a capacity for celebrating the goodness of creation 
with a commitment to resisting systems of domination. For Ruther, such communities offer three key contributions. First, they shape the spiritual and ritual practices that stimulate biophilia, love of life. Second, they engage with local institutions to construct, quote, pilot projects of ecological living, end quote. And third, they radiate out through networks that aim to mobilize concrete responses to the systems of domination. Through aligning our energies with communities of celebration and resistance, we can bridge the gap between ecological ideals like integral ecology and embodied practices as well as the gap between personal conversion and collective transformation. So as we close, I'd just like to lift up two lay Catholic communities that I believe are creatively incarnating ecological, social, and theological ideals that resonate deeply with the work of Ruther, as well as the work of Pope Francis and Thomas Merton. The two communities are the Agape community in Hardwick, Massachusetts, and Benincasa community in Guilford, Connecticut. Both communities are striving to embody an integral ecology by holding together spirituality, ecology, and social justice. Both communities are actively attempting to remember their place in the earth community while resisting systems of domination and responding to the interior sickness which undergirds our broken status quo. As we turn away from the practices and systems that breed eco-social degradation, and as we turn toward generative alternatives, May we be guided by the prophet Isaiah's ancient call to beat our swords into plowshares. May we turn our weapons of war into tools for tending a sustainable, just, and fully flourishing future. And may we be guided by the wide web of scholars, activists, and communities striving to incarnate integral ecology in the here and now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. <clears throat> I can imagine others like I do listen to your words and experience some discomfort. Um, knowing that none of us are perfect in this, and perhaps many of us are, are far from perfect. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. And I um, appreciate the experience of discomfort that you, you provoke, because I think it's perfectly appropriate. I've got a few questions I would like to pose to you and, and would invite others to send along questions if you have some that you'd like to have me pose to Jim. Um, one of the first things that occurs to me as I'm listening to you is I was beginning to contrast what on one hand I, I see all the eco words, eco justice, ecology, et cetera. And I contrast that with ego. Yeah. And I think, oh, I think I do a lot more with ego than I do eco. And when I think about the, the whole ego versus eco thing, I think about Merton and true self. Yeah. Um, have you done anything with the eco echo thing? And have you imagined what Merton's true self might do to that? Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, absolutely. I, I teach at Iona um, a class called Religion in the Natural World. And throughout that class, probably at least 50 times throughout the class, I show this side-by-side -side image of ego, which is envisioned as a pyramid 
with human beings, the human person at the top of the pyramid, uh, and eco, an ecological vision, uh, which is a circle in which human beings are woven into this wider web of life. And I think that's a really helpful way of thinking about two dramatically different states of consciousness, but also two dramatically different ways of organizing society. Um, I think that Merton's distinction between the true self and the false self maps on to that distinction between ego and eco uh, very well. And I think one of the primary offerings that he has as we kind of flesh out this understanding of integral ecology um, is the role of contemplative practice in bringing about a transformation because, you know, as Merton points out, we've got to deal with this interior sickness. Um, and, and then we've also got to deal with the ways in which this interior sickness, you know, which is maybe a product of the false self ultimately uh, manifests in these systems of domination that false selves construct, uh, inherit, and inhabit. So I, I, I definitely um, appreciate you lifting that up. And I, I think Merton has a lot of wisdom for us as we try to navigate from ego to eco. Thank you. That, that's um, a really helpful lead in terms of where some of us may go. Um, thinking about another, another contrast, um, I, I appreciate hearing about Pope Francis and the integral ecology. Um, I think about integral and um, the wholeness that Delio talks about, whole making. And I think, oh, if you've got it integrated, the problem is most of us are, are disintegrators. We're dealing with more disintegration than we are integration, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm again intrigued by how do, how do you swing from being uh, I think Ruther's word is polluter, uh, disintegrator is my word here. How do, how do I begin to, to become uh, a mover towards the positive, towards the integration? Do you have yeah. any words of wisdom from yeah. Ruther or Merton? Or? Absolutely. I mean, I, I love Ruther's emphasis uh, on these communities of celebration and resistance. Um, I think the key element of moving from being a disintegrator to an integrated person uh, is involvement in, you know, intentional communities uh, that are, you know, as uh, Peter Morin described the Catholic worker as a place where it's easy to be good. Um, so we need these communities that uh, guide us into integrated living. Uh, and I've found uh, a couple of these communities to have a particularly powerful impact uh, on my own life. And th those were the two that I highlighted there. Agape and Benicasa, um, but there's a whole network of these communities, and I think the powerful and important insight that that Ruther provides is we really can't do this alone because thinking that we're alone is part of the problem. I mean, that's that's ego, right? To be an individual or to be convinced of one's individuality is a symptom of the false self and, and of the problem, you know, and, and we've got to work our way out of that tangled knot uh, and that illusion through immersing ourselves in community. I really think that's the only way. Help, help me become more hopeful as you are. Um, I'm an old guy who, who remembers a lot of the the, the uh, countercultural communities that popped up in the 60s. Um, I think about the 19th century and all the, the utopian communities, almost none of which made it. And most of the ones out of the 60s didn't make it. So what gives you hope that Agape or Benincasa or others within the network 
um, can can be change makers in a way that affects all of us who who aren't in those communities. Yeah. Well, I think these communities already are um, making profound changes through the experiences that people have when they show up there. And then that radiates out. And, you know, one thing I've dis I've been in conversation with um, Karen Gargamelli McCrate, who's the co-founder of Ben and Casa, um, we've talked about this, like, what does it mean for a community to be successful? Uh, what does it mean for an intentional community and its efficacy uh, if it ultimately, you know, goes into supernova, so to speak, you know, doesn't doesn't last forever. Um, but maybe that's not the best mark of efficacy, right? This kind of permanence or this perception of permanence that maybe communities come into uh, an organized pattern for a period of time, generate a lot of energy like a star does, and then they could go into supernova and spread that energy, radiate that energy out through all of the people who were involved uh, in that network, you know, who might then go on and start their own communities. But, you know, that being said, I, I'm, I really believe it is important to maintain a lineage and to be connected to a history. Um, and I think many of these communities that I'm drawn to are connected to this wider web, right? So it's not just like one particular community, that one community manifests a wider web of relationships in a particular place and at a particular time. And there's power that is generated there, transformative power in the people who show up there, you know, everyone from high school students, the college students at both Ben and Casa and Agape who get into the soil, who reclaim their sense that, you know, to be human is to be connected to the earth, you know, and who have an actual experiential encounter that then they take with them, you know, but I think we've got to start somewhere and trust the process and, and sow seeds uh, for a, a mysterious harvest, which will be the transformation of our world. Mm -hmm. I like that. And, and as you were talking, I was, I was reminded of, I, I think as Merton makes a distinction between individuals and persons, mm -hmm. and uh, in some ways talks about how you have you have a sense of being an individual that's over and against nature, which is perhaps characteristic of the domination system. Certainly, Delio does that, and and others in the contemporary period. How how do you think that we can find our ways back to seeing ourselves as as integral to nature rather than over against nature? And many of us are urban develop uh, urban urban livers, so that. You know, nature is even a little more remote, it seems, than I grew up on a farm where it was kind of in my face compared to the way it is now in the city. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't think we have to go far. And I think Joy Harjo's poem, Remember, uh, opens up these countless doorways that we can walk through uh, into coming back into contact with our true nature, which is, you know, that we're beings who are woven into this wider web of life inextricably. Um, I think about, you know, a, a quote from Carl Sagan, uh, where he talks about the idea that the calcium in our teeth and the iron in our blood connects us to cosmic events, connects us to to stars that exploded out in space. So there really is no point of our existence that we can separate out from this wider web. And we can constantly be reminded uh, of our embeddedness in this community of life. Um, I think though, you know, that being said, 
it, it is powerful to carve out particular places uh, where it's, it's easier to recognize uh, our place in this wider community. So just to give you one example, you know, at Iona, we've got a on-campus garden, we've got some raised beds, and just to take students out there and to talk about soil as something that's alive, that's teeming with life, you know, that a, a fistful of healthy soil contains more microorganisms than there have been human beings on planet Earth since our history on this planet. And that that our bodies and our being are inextricable from that soil. You know, it's even in the word itself, human. To, to be human is to be of the humus of the soil uh, or in the Hebrew language to be human the word for human is Adam, uh, and the word for soil is Adama, and there's this sense uh, of the inherent link. So I think, you know, we're constantly reminded there's constant opportunities uh, to walk through a gate of remembrance uh, of our true nature and out of this illusion that we're individuals and separate uh, from the whole, um, but it is powerful to set up specific contexts mindfully that you know can can almost operate like ritual places or ritualized places for people to physically get back in contact with the earth and our connection to it yeah, you know? yeah i like that our friend chris premuk has just given us a nice question jim to your mind how significant might it be that Rachel Carson, Ruther, Delio, Elizabeth Johnson, Kathleen Danen, Monica Weiss, and so many others who are pioneers emphasizing eco-theological perspectives right from their vantage points as women, and from that vantage point are perhaps challenging more traditionally masculine visions of our relationship with the planet? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Chris. And, you know, one of the most powerful aspects of Ruther's work in particular, but also a number of the figures that were just mentioned, Elizabeth Johnson, Kathleen Degnan, et cetera, um, is this sensitivity to the link between these systems of domination, namely patriarchy, um, and the eco-crisis, and right? that ultimately what I get from the work of thinkers like Ruther, Elizabeth Johnson, Kathleen Degnan, et cetera, um, is that we need this holistic response. We need what Francis calls an integral ecology. We need to take seriously the fact that our ecological crisis is not just caused by anthropocentrism or the centering of human beings and human interests. It's really caused by these systems of domination, these systems of hierarchy, hierarchical dualism that lift up some human beings above other human beings as well as the wider earth community. You know, and, and Ruther has this great quote where she says, if we don't properly diagnose the problem, we'll never come up with the proper solution. Um, so we've really got to look at these systems of domination. I think particularly like as they manifest, particularly like the system of patriarchy, um, but then also as they interlock with one another um, in bringing about this unjust and unsustainable status quo, you know, but the, the wisdom of those scholars has profoundly impacted my sense uh, of what the eco-crisis is, diagnosing the problem, um, and then thinking about what a constructive solution might look like, which always has to bring together social justice with sustainability. Yeah, through all this, I, I've been intrigued that you really, at least I don't think you've referenced the whole economic peace. And I, I wonder, again, the cynic in me wonders, <clears throat> unless, unless we can change the economic um, model, 
I'm not, I'm not sure whether anything significant is going to happen. Maybe I hang out with my business buddies too much, but um, which, you know, cynically, I could say, well, unless it, unless the cost starts to be too much, I don't know whether people are going to change. How do you respond to that? Does Merton respond? I mean, Merton's a, a guy living simply as a monk. Ruther, whom I knew, uh, was not exactly living in luxury. So, uh, yeah. Well, I think the economic piece is is huge, and that you know, Ruther talks about corporate globalization as yep. another system of domination, and I think that. Think that we need to work our way out of that and build radical alternatives to it, you know, as the Catholic worker uh, statement or as a statement that constantly echoes in Catholic workers goes, we've got to build the new in the shell of the old. Because frankly, you know, this existing corporate system is, is really not all that fulfilling. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I, I love this quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, where she points out that the average American can identify 100 corporate logos and 10 plants, you know, and, and she highlights that to signify like how our world, how our experience of the world has been mediated to us by these corporate entities, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we can gradually extricate ourselves from that uh, and get in touch with, with these plants, you know, learn more than, learn, learn to identify more than 10 plants. That's another thing I do at Iono with all of my students. We get this app called PlantNet. And we go around campus and just try to identify trees and plants. And it changes our sense um, of where we are, that we're not just in a space that we move through to go to class or, you know, to, to go to the cafeteria. We're in an ecosystem, you know, and I, and I think as we find ourselves, as we come back to reality and come back to our senses and our sense of place, um, in this natural world, which is amazing and beautiful, um, I think there's going to be a natural shift away from that corporate mediated climate, which is kind of a, a hollow mirage at the end of the day. I mean, that being said, you've got to have personal transformation, like transformation of consciousness, coupled with systemic change. You know, so I think we do need to think about um, altering this economic system at the level of policy as well. Um, but beginning with building the new and the shell of the old, um, coming up with radical alternatives or joining into radical alternatives that already exist, you know, that can go a long way uh, in giving us a taste for an alternative that that again already exists it just needs to radiate outward and become the new normal uh, rather than you know a, a, a radical possibility yeah, thank you for that i was we've got uh tom in an email reference to schumacher's small is beautiful i th remember that um as you were talking i was also thinking well, we haven't we haven't talked about sin tonight, at least with the word. We've perhaps been talking about sin for an hour. Um, I was thinking about Carl Menninger's old book, Whatever Happened to Sin. Uh, and even though we don't use the word, we're still doing it. So as we get ready to throw it back to Teresa, one of the things I often like to ask people, you've been doing this work now, you're teaching about it, um, all this stuff. Give us a, a quick sense of how, how all this work has affected you as a person and and uh, placed you where you are with us tonight. And, and what does it mean for you going forward, personally? Yeah, I mean, I, I view any of my academic work as just inextricable from my personal commitments. And I'm kind of following Ruther in that. I mean, she... You know, there's a great quote by Gary Dorian where he says, you know, behind every book that Ruther wrote was a community. 
Um, so I, I think that, you know, it's, it's about, as the Catholic workers put it, it's about clarification of thought. Uh, it's about scholars becoming workers and it's about, you know, engaging in these ideas and then actually trying to embody them to experiment with them. So that's just kind of what I'm committed to. Um, I mean, in terms, since you mentioned sin, I feel like I should say something about that. <laughs> and I think I like, I really like Ruther's interpretation of original sin, which is that we come into this world um, in, embedded in systems of domination, like even uh, from before we emerge from the womb, the impact of these systems of domination uh, weighs on us and shapes us, um, and we inherit them and we inhabit them. Uh, and our task in confronting uh, the the systems of sin uh, is to convert away from them, both personally, interpersonally. Uh, and then ultimately, collectively, I think Merton has a lot of interesting things to say about sin, too, and he he traces it to the false self. Um, so, you know, how does it manifest interior, at an interior level, but then how does it manifest in these systems that we find ourselves in? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, thank you, Jim, for your challenging and gentle presentation. I was thoroughly engrossed, and I, I just really appreciated what you brought to us this evening. I want to also thank Dan Horan and the Spirituality Center at St. Mary's College for providing the Zoom platform and technical support for Tuesdays with Merton. I thank Alan Culp for so artfully moderating the questions, and Bob Grip, who posts the webinars on YouTube, and also Mark Mead, who makes them available as podcasts. I want to thank all of you for joining us today and for continuing to spread the good word about Tuesdays with Merton. You can find links to the recordings of previous webinars at merton.org slash ITMS. There you will also find information about the International Thomas Merton Society. If you are not already a member, we invite you to consider joining. We also welcome donations to support Tuesdays with Merton. And now I have to inform you that Tuesdays with Merton is taking a summer vacation. We will return on September 12th when Mark Mead will address the question, the seven story mountain at 75, classic or déclassé? So for now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in September.